So you can just take little notes on each one of these if you want. If I can say one important thing under each habit that you want to write down, then I've succeeded. Okay? And hopefully some of them you'll maybe write down two or three things. So, first of all, uh, accept who you are. As a result of our training, influences of musicians around us and the amount of competition at various stages of our careers. We are all at different levels of musical development. This is not good or bad, it is simply who we are at this particular point in our lives. Try to find out who you are by asking those around you, for asking those whose opinions you respect. Then believe what they tell you. Very important. Leave yourself open to criticism without getting defensive. Look at yourself and be realistic about what you have accomplished. Continue to set goals for yourself, but make them reachable goals, both short-term and long-range long goals. So here are some good examples. <clears throat> short, short-range, um, well, they're really both. One, I will work on articulation every day this term, because my tonguing really is not very good and it's not very fast. I will learn the entire Creston Sonata at Tempo this month, or whatever your teachers, you're working on with your teacher. I will be in the top ensemble at my school by next year. I will do everything possible to get a music scholarship at a good school of music. Those are all really good, reachable goals. These are not so good, only because they are really kind of impossible to attain. I will be the best saxophonist in the world. You know? <laughs> right? I know, there's someone at every school that thinks he's going to be the best saxophone player in the world, but anyway. Or, I will make a million dollars playing the saxophone. You know, there's only one saxophonist who's done that. And uh, I've thought about changing my name to Vinny G, but, you know, I don't think it'll help. Anyway. <laughs> Kenny G follows me everywhere. His music does, you know, especially in Southeast Asia. He's very, very popular. So I get off the plane, I go to the first airport, and there's Kenny G playing over the loudspeaker, you know? And especially at Christmas time, oh my God, they play his Christmas album everywhere and stuff like that, you know? So he's very, very popular. Anyway, second habit, work to improve. The point of practicing your art is simply to improve, to raise the level of your performance each semester and each year. The one thing I have learned throughout 40 years of teaching is that everyone has strengths and weaknesses. The point of practice is to address your weaknesses and to improve upon your strengths. The extent of that level of improvement is the result of several factors. Certainly the number of hours you spend in the practice room is an enormous factor. But I have known musicians who don't know how to use their time to the best advantage. And they waste a lot of time by not practicing efficiently. I always question whenever anyone says, yeah, I practice like eight to ten hours a day. I just go, wow, why? <laughs> you know? <laughs> why do you do that? It really shouldn't be necessary for you to do that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, saxophonists can put their instrument together. <laughs> they can warm up this way. That's probably not really the best way to warm up your muscles and everything, you know? And so, <clears throat> I really don't recommend doing that, um, just because you can. So, you have to realize <clears throat> that a good teacher will give you things to incorporate into your daily practice routine in order to improve those areas that are problematic. A proper warm-up routine develops both your muscles and your ears. I always try to start my practice routine with some simple stretches. Then I work on tone quality, intonation, articulation, and scales. That's the very first thing. So, just so that you guys get an idea of what kind of stretches you can do to just help kind of limber up your fingers and everything, I want all of you to stand up. So the first thing we do <coughs> is just put 
your fingers together like this and just push a little bit on your fingers. Okay, not your palms yet, just your fingers like this. You push until you kind of feel your, the muscles in your fingers burn just a little bit and then just hold it. So the goal of stretches is not to cause severe pain. Okay, this is not the no pain, no gain school. It's just to push them until you feel a little bit of stress, hold it, and as you hold it, you'll feel some of that um, tingling start to subside, and then you relax. Okay? Then, put your palms together. Okay? <laughs> I was just over in Southeast Asia, and I do this a lot. Like that. Okay? So, push your palms together, and push pretty hard. Okay? Now, you're going to feel that in your arms, your upper arms, your shoulders, your neck, everything. And just, just push and hold it. How long? Maybe, I don't know, 10 seconds. Okay? Then, move slowly to one side, and hold it there. And slowly move over to the other side. and relax. All right, now take your left arm, hold out your left arm, <laughs> your other left, there we go, okay, all right, and then pull your fingers back like this, and just pull, and you'll feel it in this part of your arm in particular, so as soon as you start to feel that burning sensation, then just hold it. Grab your fingertips like this and pull like this and you'll feel it pull on the top part of your arm. Good, good. Alright, now the other arm. Same thing. <coughs> fingers back. Yeah, you can do it with your fingers down or your fingers up, whatever you prefer, it doesn't matter. Turn it over, pull your fingertips back in. Good. This really helps. I developed um, from practicing soprano saxophone a lot. I recorded not long ago the John Mackey Concerto for Soprano Saxophone and Wind Ensemble. And very hard piece, 25 minutes long and five movements of nothing but fast notes, you know. So to learn that piece, I had to play, play soprano every day for two or three hours. And it took me four months to learn that piece and then record it. And so <clears throat> in the pro process of playing that much soprano, because you hold a lot of weight with your thumbs and with your, you know, on soprano. And <clears throat> I developed some tendonitis in my hands which is the same thing as tennis elbow, you know, and it was very, very painful. And <clears throat> so I learned that it's really, really important to do some stretches. That helped me a lot when I was having trouble with my arms and stuff. And so, so far in this whole tour, I've been practicing a lot and playing a lot, and I've been doing stretches every day before I practice, and it really seems to help a lot. And I do exactly what I'm telling you to do now. So let's do one more. <clears throat> Hold your arms out at your sides. Don't hit the person next to you. <laughs> this is my chance. Bam! Right. Okay? Hold your hands out. <clears throat> now, I want you to make circles with your hands. Like this. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stop. Go the other way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stop. Move your hands out in front of you. There we go. Same thing. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stop. Other way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. <clears throat> Over your head. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know why women always look so much more graceful doing this. You know, guys look like a bunch of dweebs. <laughs> All right. The other way. One. Two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Relax. You feel that really pull in your forearms, right? Okay, now I want you to shake it out. Shake it out, yeah. All right, like this, just at your sides. Out like this, shake. Here we go. Out like this in front of you, shake. All right, relax. Sit down. Thank you. Now you're ready to practice. Okay? It's really, really good at teaching at the university level. There are a lot of students that develop problems. Certain instruments <coughs> um, cause more problems than others. A lot of violinists have trouble because of the position that they're in all the time, you know, and they have trouble with their shoulders and with their arms and things like that, their elbows. Uh, pianists have a lot of trouble because with carpal tunnel and that sort of thing because of this movement of repetitive motion a lot. So <coughs> um, it really, really helps if you know some way to kind of relax and stretch those muscles before you start to practice, and then don't overuse it, okay? So when you're practicing, my recommendation is you should practice for like 50 minutes, 5-0, five, 50 minutes, then take 10 minute break. And relax your muscles, and then you can go ahead and, you know, answer your, mess, your texts on your phone for 10 minutes, and then come back and practice for another 50 minutes, and then take another 10 minute break. You've got to give yourself time off. Don't practice two or three hours straight without a break at all, because that's when you start getting problems, okay? So, uh, let's see. Always start each practice session by getting the best possible sound. I ask myself that question. Is this the best sound I can get today? If not, if I have a really old read that doesn't sound very good, I throw the read away and I put on another one, you know? I want to get, every day, I want to get the best sound I can get. <clears throat> if you can't hear the problem, you can't address it, nor can you improve it. So you're really listening to everything you do and figure out what's happening every day. At all levels of musicianship, we are all working to improve all the time for the remainder of our careers. I tell my students that I'm still working to improve even after all these years. If you think I'm pretty good now, just wait until I turn 70. Yeah. You know? And by the time I'm 80, look out. I'm going to be a monster. You know? Okay? All right. It is critical that you remember the two rules of practicing. Number one, don't play anything faster than you can play it evenly. Don't play a C major scale like this. And then you get to F sharp major and you go Alright, practice all of your scales at the same tempo, playing them very, very evenly and then gradually work the speed up, okay? Um, I <clears throat> work with high school students every year at the summer music camp we have at, at the University of Kansas. And <laughs> part of their audition is to play scales. So I'll usually say, all right, why don't you play, uh, you know, C major, the full range of the horn or two octaves, you know? And then the next one is I say, how about uh, A flat major? Whoa, <laughs> do they slow down in a hurry, you know? So. You've got to know all of your scales, all 12 majors at least for now, okay? Um, don't play the first line of an etude at the tempo marked, and then allow yourself to slow down when the going gets tough. I judge a lot of solo and ensemble contests, um, and have for the last 40 years. And <coughs> when a student comes in playing a piece like the one I played for you, La Cascada, something that's that difficult, and they come in and play it like this. Uh, this is another one. This is Eugene Bosa. 
level piece, right? And they heard some university saxophone playing it, and so they think they can do it. You know, usually I give them a really low score, usually a three or something like that, you know, and then I'm the bad guy because I gave their best saxophones to three, oh my god, you know. But the reason is because it was just very, very, very sloppy. I would rather you play something easier or at least play that piece slower and very evenly. <laughs> first, then speed. My son Brian is a professional clarinetist. He took lessons from a teacher. He's had several really good clarinet teachers. And one of his teachers, and I can't remember which one, told his students to always play everything perfectly the first time. Think about that. Think about that. In order for you to play something <clears throat> as difficult as the piece I played for you perfectly the first time, you're going to have to pull it out, sit down, and plan on spending a long time practicing because you're going to do it at this tempo. how long it's going to take you to play through this whole piece. But if you play it at that tempo, you can play it perfectly the first time. You can get all the notes right, you can get all the rhythms right, you can get all the articulations right, you can play with dynamics that are written, and do everything perfectly the first time. If you learn how to do that, you're going to improve much, much faster. Most of my students try to play an etude too fast right away. Then they learn something wrong. They learn the wrong articulation, the wrong rhythm, something like that. Then they have to go back and relearn that rhythm and slow it way down and practice it slowly anyway. And it's much, much easier if you learn to practice slowly. It's very, very important. <coughs> um, I, <laughs> when my son comes home and he's practicing, I just listen to him and I'm just amazed at how slow he can practice. You know, it takes so much discipline and control to learn how to do that. But, man... His technique is just amazing, just because he practices slowly a lot. So it's not all about speed, okay? All right, <clears throat> so that's the first rule of practicing. Second rule of practicing is to isolate the problem. Is the problem fingering, tongue and finger coordination, rhythm, tempo, articulation, ornamentation, breathing, phrasing, vibrato, or response. What is it? You know? And a lot of times my students know there's a problem, but they're not sure what it is. You know? On the saxophone, <coughs> and on any, any woodwind instrument, um, the third finger is the weakest finger. We don't generally pick things up like this, you know? We don't do anything with that finger by itself. So it's a very weak finger. It always works with the other one. So when you're going from C to D, for example, on the saxophone, you're putting down five fingers at once. Which one always hits last? That lazy third finger right here, you know? And so then you get, uh, and you get a high note squeaking, and it's not very even, you know? Because those fingers are not all going down at the same time. So really it's a fingering problem, and a lot of my students say, oh, my, it's my throat, I've got to do this, it's a response problem. 
It's a fingering problem. All right? So you really try, try your best to figure out what the problem is. Practice that very slowly, and you bracket that section that you're having trouble with. That measure, that two measures, that line, that four lines, whatever it is. You know, If you go through my music here, you'll see all kinds of brackets around different parts. Then I work on those sections ten times as much as I work on anything else. There are days where I only have 30 minutes of practice, so I do my warm-ups, and that's all. There are days where I only have an hour, so I do a half-hour warm-up, and then I do a half-hour where I just practice bracketed sections. You know? And that's all I do. Just practice them slowly and try to get them a little bit better and a little bit faster. When I start to move the tempo up, I incorporate the measure before and the measure after. Then I incorporate the whole line and work on them and boost the tempo back up to where the rest of the piece is. Okay? All right. Um, the fact is that we practice to increase our average. To go from playing a selection perfectly one out of ten times to playing it perfectly seven or eight out of ten times. That's what practicing is about. This increases our chances of playing well on a performance. If you can only play a certain passage correctly, perfectly, one out of ten times, when you go to perform that piece, you're probably not going to play that section very well, are you? But if you can play it right seven or eight times out of ten, then you're probably going to nail it. You know? So, <clears throat> accept the fact that, contrary to popular belief, you cannot perform your best on a performance. I have never played my best on a performance. And I've done hundreds of performances now. I have never played my best on a performance. If you want to hear me play my best, come on over to my house where I practice and stand outside with the door closed and listen to me practice. And man, you're going to hear some really cool stuff, you know? Because that's where I play my best. When there's pressure, when, there are a lot, when there's an audience and you're nervous and all that stuff, you're not going to play your best. You know? When you heard me play La Cascada just a few minutes ago, I dropped some notes on the floor. Did you hear that? I had some mistakes, a couple of finger flubs, and I'm a professional musician, so I know how to fake my way through it and just keep going. I don't go, <laughs> make faces, all right? You don't make faces. You don't let the audience know you screwed up, all right? So, I can fake my way through it. But Todd heard every mistake I made, you know? He heard those five notes drop on the floor, like that. Okay, four. Oh, okay, four. Good. Thank you. Uh, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. All right. So, anyway, the fact is that you cannot perform your best. You perform your average. So, but there aren't many teachers that say, all right, now I want you to go out there and play your average. You know? <laughs> but that's really what you're doing. Okay? So, keep that in mind. All right. <clears throat> A former percussion teacher at my university used two buckets and ten ping pong balls. He had two buckets set up here. This one had ten ping pong balls in it. He used to play a, a passage, and if he played it perfectly, he took the ping pong ball out and put it in this bucket. He played it perfectly again, sorry, drummer. He played it perfectly again, he took another ping pong ball out and put it in that bucket. If he played it again and made a mistake, he took this ball out and put it back. <laughs> right? And his goal was to play that thing until he could play it through ten times perfectly in a row. Well, <laughs> uh, that's pretty extreme, you know? I mean, I think it's a good technique for practicing one little section, one measure or something like that, or one little line of stuff and get that better and better and better. But probably not for an entire movement or a complete work. You know? If I use this technique for an entire concerto, <laughs> I'm afraid you would have to visit me at the home for the musically disenchanted. You know? I don't think I would ever be able to play a concerto through ten times without making a mistake. That's just crazy. Nobody does that. You know? You are, you live in a world right now that is so advanced electronically and techn technologically that you are used to hearing perfection. So you listen to a CD, and there are no mistakes on the CD. Every note is perfect, you know? 
because they can dump it into a computer and they can do all this stuff, you know. And on the John Mackey concerto that I recorded, yes, it took eight hours to record it, but then it took about another 16 hours to edit it. And there were some places, there's one place where I had to hit these high Fs, those of you are sessional players, right? And it, I got done with this long cadenza, and then I had to go, the high Fs over and over and over again, you know? Well, you know, I missed about half of them, because that note is really hard to hit on soprano. And so we were able to go in the editing room, and he took a high F out of this section and just popped it in there, and it was perfect. Wow, that's cool. How about that one? Yeah, I got that one too. And so it sounds really, really good. But I can't play it live that way, you know? All right? So <clears throat> don't think that you have to play it as well as Todd, Todd Yukimoto's recording of that piece, because his recording, as good a player as he is, his recording has some editing stuff that went on, and it was perfect. You know? Okay? So, don't aim for perfection. That's what I'm trying to say. Everybody makes mistakes. And just hope that your mistakes are minimal. That's it. Alright. Number three. Are there any questions so far? Raise your hand if you have any. No? Okay. Number three. Respect yourself and those around you. Everyone has something to offer, and it should be given respect. We all need validation that what we do is important and that what we contribute is noticed. There are people in this world who do the same thing day after day without much recognition. They work a factory job and they do the same thing over and over and over again. Others don't seem to care whether they do their jobs well or not, and they are only evaluated maybe once a year or once every six months, something like that. How fortunate we are as musicians to be evaluated on a regular basis, especially as students. Someone cares about us every time we perform. However, often that caring is in the form of criticism, something we need to know in order to improve, but something that is difficult to swallow at times. In the United States, we have experienced tremendous great inflation throughout the past 40 years. So. Forty years ago, when I was in college, <clears throat> you know, the average grade, every teacher said this at the beginning of every class. They would walk in and they'd say, in my class, the average grade is a C. If you're doing good work, you'll, you will get a C in my class. And that's really a good grade. If you're not doing good work, you'll get a D or maybe an F. If you do exceptional work, I'll give you a B. Only three of you in this class will earn A's. And that's the way it was. You know? So if you graduated with a 3.0 average, you were like, yeah, all right, that's cool. <laughs> you know? Right now, I can tell by the looks on your faces, it's like, oh my God, I see, my mom would kill me. You know? So we've had great inflation. And right now, everybody gets A's and B's. No one gets C's unless, I mean, that's like a fail failing grade. It's a C. So, <clears throat> that's not necessarily a really good indication of how you're doing. I give my students A's and B's, because if they get below a B minus in saxophone lessons, they get kicked out of the program. You know? So, almost all my students get A's and B's. Some of them really deserve C's, but I can't do that, because it'll kick them out of the program, and I know they just had a rough semester. You know? They broke up with their boyfriend, whatever. You know? Okay? So, <clears throat> musicians deal with criticism in different ways. Some take it as a personal attack and get very defensive. And others use criticism as a way to beat themselves up. And I have students that do that. I'll say one little thing about that they have to improve on, and they just go home and they're just like, oh, I'll never get any better. I just, you know, and they cry and all kinds of stuff. No, it's not about that. You have to learn how to take criticism. When I criticize you in a lesson or a rehearsal, I am not calling you stupid or worthless, nor am I saying you are the worst musician I have ever heard. You must use criticism as a way to improve, but more than that, it is a way to test your self-respect. If you have a healthy respect for yourself, you are able to take criticism and work to improve. You know you are here because you are wanted. The 
fact that your teacher criticizes you doesn't mean any less than that. You're still a good player, but he just wants you to do it a different way and to make it a little bit better in his terms, on his terms. Okay? You might not even agree with your teacher, but he's the boss, so you do it his way. When you get to be old like me, you do it your way. Okay? All right? Sorry, I'm not old. I decided that I am upper middle aged. <laughs> okay? I am upper middle aged and I'll be that way until I'm about 80. After 80, then I'll, I'll probably say I'm old. Okay? Anyway. <clears throat> Alright. Um, criticism is given to improve the quality of your individual performance within the ensemble, and yours is a critical part of that improvement. Respect yourself as a student who is there to learn and improve your art. Respect yourself and those around you for their feedback and support in that process. Being a musician is learning how to work with others. You will almost never perform alone. The group effort demands that you pay respect to the other musicians in the ensemble, for each of them has an important role to play. It is difficult to make music with musicians you don't like or respect, so learn to tolerate more people. Work to get, <laughs> and you heard Todd and I, after we played that duet, we both said, yeah, man, shook hands, and, yeah, it sounded great, you know? Really, I don't like him at all, but no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. We have a lot of respect for each other, and we make sure and tell each other that as often as we can, you know? And we also criticize each other. We were rehearsing that duet, and we stopped and say, well, that's rushing, that tempo is rushing a little bit, or you're slowing down a little bit, or, you know? And we criticize each other, and... We're big boys, so we can take it, you know, okay? All right. <clears throat> As, um, sorry, work to get others to like and respect you. As you move in your career from student to teacher, although we are all students for our entire lives, use what you have learned to become a great teacher. Remember the situations that had an impact on your life and try to be a part of that same process for your students. In order for that to happen, you must respect yourself and those around you. Number four, be responsive and responsible. Be alert, be attentive, and be a sponge. One that is able to soak up as much information as possible from every lesson and every rehearsal. Take criticism well and adapt new ideas to your plan. They might not all work for you, but they are worth a try for a period of time. It is your responsibility to improve your art. It is your responsibility to devote daily practice toward improvement. As a serious musician, you deserve this time for yourself. When practicing, do not answer the door. And ask family members and friends to not interrupt your practicing. Do not text or answer your cell phone while practicing. Turn it off. Put it away. Yeah, why is everyone looking at you? Uh -huh. the, whole, you know, the whole line is just staring at you, you know? Anyway. <laughs> I know. You guys are so used to just doing this all the time. But turn the phone off, put it away, and practice one hour or two or whatever your time is. Then turn your phone back on and you can text. You can text during the break as long as you don't spend more than 10 minutes doing it, okay? But don't let that thing rule your life so much that it really interrupts your practice time or your study time or anything else, you know? Practice your ensemble music so you will be a valuable contributing member of the ensemble. And the band directors who are in this room, you guys owe me one for this, all right? Ensemble rehearsals are not for you to learn your part. But... To learn how your part contributes to the whole. That's his job. That's his job. The band directors who are in the room, it's their job to put everything together. It's your job to come into rehearsal with your part ready to go. Alright? Okay. Use negative situations to improve. I have had my share of less than stellar teachers from whom I learned what not to do with my students. In many ways, they influenced my teaching as much as the great teachers I had. You know, you can learn something from everybody. I tell people that in my 40 years of teaching, I have now taught close to 1,500 
1,500 saxophone students. That's more people than go to school here. That's a lot of saxophone players. Some of them had one or two lessons with me during music camp or something. Some of them, let's see, the record holder, I think, is a young woman who studied with me for 11 years, you know? All the way from the time she was 12 until she graduated from college, you know? So, <clears throat> um, why did I say that? I forgot. Oh, um, I have learned something from from every one of those students, because they all have different experiences. So they come to me having studied with Todd Yukimoto or somebody else, and they go, wow, yeah, Todd used to say this. And I go, wow, cool, I'll have to remember that. That made me a better teacher, you know? Or they bring something, either, either a positive thing or maybe a negative thing. I've had students come to me that make a sound on the saxophone with their tongue that I've never heard before. Two students out of 1,500 have done this. And the sound is just the weirdest thing I've ever heard. You know? It's like, listen. Sorry, I didn't mean to put such a pregnant pause in there, but I have to get a drink of water. <clears throat> listen. Becoming a good musician is nothing more than training your ears. In fact, I tell people what I do for a living is I am an ear trainer, first and foremost. And secondly, I'm a habit breaker. Bad habits that people get into. I learned how to break all kinds of bad habits, you know? I don't have a 12-step program yet, but I'm thinking about it. Okay? So, <clears throat> if you can't hear it, you can't change it. So try to hear everything your teachers tell you to listen for. Even in band rehearsals and stuff, if he's talking to the trumpets, try to listen to what they're doing and what he's telling them to do and see if you can hear a difference and all that. Because the better your ears are, the better musician you're going to be. You cannot be a good musician unless you have really good ears. You know? I was at a certain school on this particular tour, and don't let me get off track too much, okay? But... At this school, there are a bunch of saxophone players that love to practice out in the hallway instead of in the practice rooms. And the, the hallways echo a lot and all this stuff, and you know. And I heard these guys playing out there so loud. It was painful. They were playing their jazz mouthpieces, you know, their heavy artillery metal mouthpieces, you know. And rah, like this, and it echoed everywhere, and then this one was trying to play louder than this one, and they were both practicing in the same area, right? I just thought, you guys are ruining your hearing. Oh my God, that's horrible. I had to walk through with my ears plugged. It was so loud. And, you know, I'm used to loud saxophone. But you've got to really take care of your ears. Don't do something. And I told them that. You know, I told the, all the saxophone players, I had them in a class like this, and I said, don't do that. You're going to hurt, permanently damage your hearing. And that's going to affect you. When you're my age, you're not going to be able to hear anything. You know? And <clears throat> so, a couple of days later, I went back to the practice rooms again. Same guys are up there going, Mah! out in the hallway. That, you know? It didn't make any difference at all. But you have to really develop your ears and protect your hearing as well. Okay. Uh, you will learn enough at your school to allow you to become a good musician if you only learn to listen and absorb what your teachers and your fellow musicians tell you. Listen to what they say and how they say it. Pay attention to what works for you, but remember that what amazes you might not affect the person sitting next to you in the same way. We all learn at different rates and in different ways. Being a great teacher is learning how to say the same thing in many different ways until it makes sense that one student, and that student, and that student, and that student. You know? The guy across the hall from me is a composition person, and he said, a composer, I guess, is the proper term. He's a composer, and he, he keeps saying, how can you stand and listen to the same etudes all day and the same lessons over and over, and you just say the same thing? I don't look at it that way at all. I was kind of surprised he said that. Because to me, every student comes in and plays for me, and it's a whole different experience. 
because they each have their own issues and I try to figure out what they're doing and we talk about it and I, I'm not even aware of the fact that four students in a row played the same thing, you know? I, I'm not aware of that at all. So, developing great ears is a lifelong study, but it is the key to becoming a better musician. You must have in your mind what you want to sound like before you play the first note. Think about the type of attack, the tone quality, the dynamic level, vibrato or not, and don't settle for anything less until you get that sound that you're going after. If that first note, you want it to be big and full and powerful, but not obnoxious, not loud, not in your face, not offensive, then try that, you know? Less tongue, a little more of this, yeah. That's the sound I want. That's it. But I have that in my head first, and then I try to get it, you know? Okay, it's very important. Um, <clears throat> remember that what you hear behind your instrument is not necessarily what your audience hears. So I think I sound pretty good, you know? But you guys are out there going, wow, why does it sound like that? <laughs> really airy and spitty and red, you know? So <clears throat> record yourself often and listen to how you sound. Listen to what the audience is hearing. Ask others to listen to you, but stay open to criticism and accept the praise as well. That's very important. Ugh, I get so tired of talented young musicians who when I do finally give them a compliment, they go, oh no, that's not right. I, don't, I didn't think so. It's like, waiting. You've been waiting for six months for me to give you a compliment. I finally do, and you negate it. You just go, nah, you're not right. Nah. <laughs> Learn how to accept compliments. All right? It's very important. Um... Most students don't know how to accept praise. Come up with a list of things to say after your recital. So, people come up to you and say, Man, that's, you really, I love your recital. What do you say? My students go, Oh, well, I don't know. I'm not sure if you got paid too much. You know? <laughs> how does that make that person feel? They're trying to give you a compliment and you're just throwing it back in their face. Accept the praise. Say things like this. Thank you so much for coming to my recital. Or, I'm so glad you enjoyed the performance. Or, your comments mean so much to me. Or, coming from you that is high praise indeed. Thank you. Or, thank you, I felt pretty good about the recital, but I would like to have another shot at the second movement of that one piece, you know. Or, thank you, I only left a small pile of notes on the floor. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just dropped a few of those while you were playing and kind of swept them under the rug. It's okay. You know? All right? Learn how to compliment others. So you can jot down any of these if you'd like. I really enjoyed your program. I would love to be able to play as musically as you do. I particularly liked the third movement of the Crescent Sonata. Or, you have the most amazing vibrato. I just said that to an oboist I heard in uh, Bangkok. He played on this recital, and I just walked up to him afterwards and I said, you have the most natural sounding vibrato. It's just beautiful. And he was like, whoa, <laughs> thank you, you know? He was kind of shocked that I would say something good. I guess. I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's really important to tell people. Uh, or just walk up and say, wonderful performance. Or, that was really fun. Or, that was really beautiful. If you don't really feel that strongly about the performance, you might want to, like, think of something creative. Like, man, you really, you certainly do play the saxophone. 
<laughs> Probably you don't want to say something like, you know, of all the recitals I've been to this year, that was certainly one of them. <laughs> That's probably not a very good thing to say, all right? He might hit you, okay? So, there is a faculty member at my university by the name of Joyce Castle. She is a star. I would say a rock star, but that's not really true. She is <clears throat> even more upper middle aged than I am. And she has had an absolutely stellar career as an opera singer. She has sung with the Metropolitan Opera and the New York City Opera and the San Francisco Opera and the Santa Fe Opera and the Chicago Lyric. And all over the world, she has sung in the top opera houses in the world. And she has been performing now, she says, for 40 years. It's a little more than that. But, <clears throat> um, and she's still performing opera roles at her age, and it's just amazing. I've never seen anyone walk out on stage, and she's this tall woman with red hair and big features, big eyes and big, you know, larger than life kind of. And she walks out, and she stands like this, and she nods to the pianist and opens her mouth, and before she even sings the first note, the whole audience is right in the palm of her hand. You know, it's just remarkable. So I have a lot of respect for her. She used to play tenor saxophone when she was in high school. And so she comes to saxophone recitals every once in a while, and especially she comes to my recitals, which I'm very flattered. And so she came up to me after a, res a recent recital, and <clears throat> she had the program in her hand. She gave me a hug, and she said, You know, I really like this first piece. Ah, well, no, it's kind of hard to say. I like the second one. She said, oh, hell, I like all of them. She said, that was just such a wonderful recital. And then she said something that I'll never forget. She said, we are so lucky to have you in our faculty. You know? And that's one of the best compliments I've ever received because I respect her so much, you know? There's another guy, Larry, Dr. Larry Massey. He used to be our clarinet teacher. He got his doctorate at Eastman School of Music, played principal in the Eastman Wind Ensemble under Frederick Fennell, you know? So he's a really good clarinetist and a good teacher and a good friend. But he's a man of few words. And so after one of my recitals, he walked up to me and he went, How about your head? First rate. And that's the nicest thing he'd ever said to me. <laughs> First drink, two words. That was it. And I knew from him that was a really big deal. You know? So, you have to learn how to do both give and receive comments after a performance. I tell my students to listen to other saxophonists for tone, vibrato, extended techniques, tonguing, jazz style, phrasing. And this is all again about listening, okay? I got off the subject there a little bit, but... Uh, I'm amazed at the number of young saxophonists who want to play jazz, but they never listen to jazz. I ask them their favorite jazz, what their favorite jazz albums are, or who their favorite jazz saxophonists are, and they don't know any of them. They don't know, not one single player. And if they say Kenny, Kenny G, I go, no. Nah. <laughs> Sorry, we need to talk. All right, anyway. Uh, this is a critical step to the development of an accurate concept of style on any instrument and in any genre of music. However, no matter what instrument you play, it is also extremely important to listen to other vocalists and instrumentalists as well, in order to develop better phrasing, vibrato, musical interpretation, and style. I love going to Joyce Castle's recital because she's just an absolute artist. And, you know, her voice is beyond its prime. And she still absolutely is captivating. It's just remarkable, you know? I love listening to people like, <clears throat> as a saxophonist, I listen to flute players, I listen to violinists, I listen to vocalists, I listen to cellists, for what to do with my vibrato, you know? Because, I don't know, I just, I want to, I want to be better. You know? Like I said, I've been working at it for a long time. And I'm not bad. In fact, I'm pretty good. I can say that. But I want to be better. I still want to be better. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Any questions so far? You're not jumping in there. So I assume everything's okay. All right. 
<laughs> you haven't left, so I assume <laughs> things are going all right. All right. Number six, network. <clears throat> this is not a television network, but this is getting to know other people. If you are a good musician who is responsive and responsible and who respects those around you, you will make friends. Musician friends will help you with your career. If you have developed the habits mentioned in this paper, you will play well and be a valuable member of any ensemble. Friends and colleagues will recommend you. Todd Komodo is connected with practically all the musicians in Honolulu. Everybody knows Todd, and everybody respects and admires Todd. Todd plays in the Royal Hawaiian Band. Todd plays in several different groups around town. He plays a lot of things, you know? And obviously he's doing it right because everyone has good things to say about him, you know? That's what it's about. So if they need a saxophone player, that's the name they're going to think of first. They call Todd, you know? If Todd is a drag and people don't get along with him very well, and he's really negative and he shows up late all the time and doesn't isn't prepared, they're not going to call him. It's that simple, you know. So it's very important. There is oh, <clears throat> there is no room in the music business for divas and egomaniacs, no matter how well you play. I'm sorry, there just isn't. How many of you have seen the movie Whiplash? Uh-huh. Remind you of your band director? Oh, I didn't say that. All right. Whiplash, the main character in that, is Terrence Blanchard, I think, is his name. Is that right? Terrence somebody. Anyway, he is just really, really extreme. He's one of the worst teachers I've ever seen because of his intimidation factor, you know? The goal is to be supportive. The goal is to help people along. The goal is to criticize gently and nurture, not absolutely destroy someone's ego, you know? And so <clears throat> there's no room in the music business for divas and egomaniacs. And people who think they're really better than everybody else are not very kind people. Do not say bad things about other musicians. It always gets back to Music is competitive, and there are several people who play at your level, who can take your place if you are not contributing to the group. Given the choice, I would much rather perform with good musicians who get along with each other than with great musicians who are difficult to work with. You know? And there are a lot of musicians out there. There are a lot of great musicians who are really, really nice people. <clears throat> work with them. Someone who has a huge ego, you don't need that person. I don't care how well they play. Forget it. You know? Don't deal with that. Okay? There are a few musicians in this world who are truly gifted, who have perfect pitch, a photographic memory, and flawless technical facility. They don't have to practice as much as most humans, and they always get recognized. They are proof that alien life forms do exist. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than comparing yourself to these people, do what Todd Yukimoto does. And bring what you have to offer. Strong musicianship, great people skills, good looks, a wonderful <laughs> sense of humor, and impeccable taste in both food and fashion. <laughs> All right? Strong music programs in universities throughout the country are producing record numbers of very fine musicians. However, the difficult economic times in which we live are presenting fewer musical opportunities. Jobs for musicians are not being handed out anywhere, and federal and state governments are cutting funding for the arts in an effort to reduce annual budgets. Rather than becoming discouraged, young musicians need to become more creative. They must take an entrepreneurial approach to creating ways to do what they love, while still accepting the realities and responsibilities of their situation. You know? If you're a good musician and you have a good product to offer, mm -hmm. people will want to come and listen to you. If you're a nice person and you network and you get to know a lot of people, they'll want to come and listen to you. You know? That doesn't always mean they're going to 
get out their checkbook and write huge checks to you all the time, you know? But I know a lot of musicians who survive from gig to gig, and they play a lot of different things, you know, in order to make it. Um, making a substantial portion of your income playing your musical instrument can only be done in large metropolitan areas like this, like Honolulu. And even if then, only if you are willing to play everything that comes along. The circus, the ice show, weddings, the rodeo or stampede, wedding receptions, the home show, the bridal show, the boat show, the truck rally, the fashion show, the, top, the hockey tournament, the dinner theater, the band concert in the park, the chamber music concert, the woodman trio at the coffee shop, or subbing with the local symphony orchestra. Any or all of those. Except the fact that you need to play what people want to hear, so you can afford to play the kind of music that really interests you. You know? All the professional players in this room have played so many weird gigs, you know? <laughs> Some really bad ones. Uh, I played a gig once with the strolling accordion player. He was this little short guy, you know, who was Mr. Personality, and he would be playing all this stuff, and like he would play a, a blues, like an 11 and a half bar blues, <laughs> instead of a 12 bar blues. He just kind of, rhythm was kind of not important to him, you know? It was horrible. It was, you know? But, hey, he paid, he paid money, you know? So I did that kind of stuff. Uh, or played with really bit bad big bands. But I had some interesting gigs. I played once in a cave, and all these rich people rented this cave at a state park or something, and they all came dressed as cavemen and women, you know? And they had a, we were the band. We didn't have to dress up as cavemen or anything. But we were the band back in the corner playing while all these guys like were eating turkey legs and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> it was pretty cool. Anyway, so work on other ways to make a living, either part-time, a part-time day job, or set up a teaching studio at a private school or a music store. When I lived in Denver after getting my master's degree, I had to figure out a way to support my family without, at least for a period of time, going back to public school teaching. I first set up a private studio then I started teaching as an adjunct saxophone instructor at first one, then two, then three universities. I think I still hold some sort of record, having at the end of this time 28 university students, two saxophone quartets and a jazz ensemble that I taught, while still maintaining a private studio of 45 students. Let's see, that's 73 saxophone students. Not all of them were ours, thank God. You know, but it was a lot of students. I also played jazz and dance band gigs every weekend, had my own saxophone quartet, and played professionally with the Harvey Vidal saxophone quartet. I did all of this for eight years. Ah, uh, to be young again. You know? <laughs> I was working about 60 to 65 hours a week. And that's what I needed to do to support my family. But, you know, I did a lot of different things. And I was actively playing the instrument all the time. And so I didn't mind the long hours, you know? Uh, learn what you like to do best and make yourself really good at it. If in the meantime a full-time playing position does open up and you win that audition, fantastic. But you need the confidence that comes with knowing you can support your passion and your life by yourself for a long time. Take the time to develop your art while developing a strong support system within the community. So all of that being said, <clears throat> most of my students at the University of Kansas, I have 25 saxophone students there. Of those, uh, let me think, 21 of them are music majors. I have four doctoral students who are going to go on and teach at universities and colleges and things like that, hopefully. And I have 20 undergrad, no, that's 16 undergraduate students. Two of them are performance majors. All the rest of them are music education majors because I was a band director and I think it's better to have that certification and do it as a, your bachelor's degree. Get a degree in music education, that way you can teach if a job opens up and you can do that. And at least you have that to fall back on. I've had a lot of students come to me at the age of 30 or 32 years old. And they've been out on the road playing with a rock band and traveling the Holiday Inn circuit around the country for a long time. And they decide that's really kind of a drag, and they don't want to do it anymore. So they come back to school to get a degree at the age of 32. That's really hard to do. You're in classes with 18-year-olds, you know, 
and you have to go full time, and you're not making a living, and you know, uh, this one guy was married and he had two kids, and it's just really hard to do it when you're that age. So I encourage a lot of my undergraduate students to get a degree in music education. Then if you want to go on in performance for a master's degree or something, you can do that. Okay? All right. <clears throat> the last thing, and then we'll wind it up. The last thing is number seven, be flexible and accept opportunities. By developing these seven habits of highly effective musicians, opportunities will arise. But you must be flexible because they may not be exactly what you had in mind. Perhaps a chance to go out on a cruise ship, or audition for a military band, or work for a public music publishing company, or become the assistant manager at the music store where you've been teaching the past 10 years. Perhaps you can take over a music store that is having financial difficulties and turn it into a successful private music school with 15 teachers and over 500 private students taking lessons, many of whom also participate in small chamber music groups, jazz combos, two big bands, and a children's choir. How's that? Did you write all that down? <laughs> you know, those are all things that you could do. Or perhaps you become best friends with a wedding planner. And you become <laughs> the booking agent for all the wedding ceremony and reception music needed by the clients. That pays really well, by the way. You know, you can make a very good living playing weddings. So, all right, one never knows what opportunities may arise, but they will come your way, and you need to be able to take advantage of them even though they do not involve becoming a member of the New York Philharmonic. Most of the musicians I know did not plan on doing what they are currently doing. Life just sort of happens, and you need to pursue your passion and make the best of your situation. Allow me to use my background as an example. The state of Montana is larger than the entire country of Germany, but it has only one million residents. As a boy growing up in Great Falls, Montana, I decided at the age of 12, that's how weird I am. At the age of 12, um, that I wanted to be a music teacher. When I got to my senior year of high school, my private teacher encouraged me to be the first one in my family to go out of state to college, because there weren't too many good music programs in the state of Montana. It was a huge step for me since I knew I had to put my own way through school. Fortunately, I got a partial music scholarship to the University of Colorado, and that enabled me to pursue my dream. Right after graduation, I got a great teaching job in Boulder, Colorado, which if you've never been there, it's a really nice town. Great college town, right at the foot of the mountains. It's very beautiful, and everybody there like, is, is cool. You know? It's one of those places. They won't lie you in town if you're wearing any kind of polyester or anything. But, you know? <laughs> They're all earth mothers, and they wear natural clothing and all that stuff, you know? But it's a great place. It really is a nice town. Um... I was a junior and senior high band director. I achieved my goal of being a high school band director, which I love, and I might still be there now, except for the fact that I hadn't continued to improve on the saxophone. I felt that both my listening and playing skills had not yet developed enough during the time I was teaching. I also never had the opportunity to study with a saxophone specialist, and that opportunity presented itself. So in those days, there were only like a half dozen universities in the whole United States that had full-time saxophone teachers. Every other school, the clarinet teacher got stuck with teaching saxophone. So at the University of Colorado, I studied with a clarinet teacher who was a brilliant man and a very good clarinetist, but he wasn't a saxophonist, you know? He played some kind of dance band saxophone on the side, but that was it. And so he never quite knew what to tell me about sound and vibrato and stuff, you know? So... Anyway, <clears throat> um, so that's the opportunity to present itself to go study with Harvey Patel. Um, I needed to know if I could hang with the big guys, you know? And so I quit my job and went to school in New York City, where I studied with a great teacher, Harvey Patel. This led to some professional performances, performance opportunities in New York City and then back to Denver, Colorado, and eventually to my becoming professor of saxophone at the University of Kansas. As a boy growing up in Great Falls, Montana, I never imagined having the opportunity to record several CDs, travel and perform over 200 concerts with a professional saxophone quartet, play in professional symphony orchestras, and perform as a soloist internationally in 17 different countries. By developing the habits mentioned in this presentation, and thanks to my very supportive wife, Jane, I was in a position to take advantage of professional opportunities when they came along. 
You are all gifted and talented, and you are fortunate to be musicians. Be proud of being a musician, and practice these seven habits of highly effective musicians. Enjoy your current musical lives, and take advantage of musical opportunities. You never know where these opportunities may lead you, but as a true musician, you will enjoy traveling along the path. Thank you. Thank you.